We want to welcome all of those joining us right now in all of our locations. Come on, Chambersburg, Leitersburg, Wilson. Come on, y'all. Can we show some love to all of our locations tuning in this weekend? So thankful for you guys. I, I want to ask you a question today. I want to jump right in. Have you, ever, have you ever done something that you said that you would never do? Like, I, 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 I don't want to ever do the thing that this guy did because I'm just not that guy. I never want to get myself caught up in that mistake. I, I don't want to do what this girl did because that's just not who I am. That's not how I was raised. I would never do that. You, you ever say something that you swore you would never say? I never talk like that to her. I love her too much. I, I never say that about him. He's perfect. I, I, I'll never say that to them. I, I care for them. And all of a sudden, the words that you said will never come out of your mouth ends up coming out. And what is said has been said and can't be unsaid. And what's done has been done. Now it's all done. Now, growing up, I was always taught... Never say never to God because God has a sense of humor. And so unbeknownst to me, prior to my wife and I getting married, my wife, Margaret, said she would never do two things. Y'all want to know what that is? Thing number one, I will never live in Maryland ever in my life. I never want to live in Maryland. I want to raise my kids in Maryland. Never want to do it. Thing number two, I never want to marry a Filipino man. I'm not sure how to take that, y'all. I'm not sure if I am God's punishment or I am God's pun to Margaret. Like, God is telling Margaret, hey, marrying Jay is my joke on you. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> the thing that Margaret is now trying to tell God that she would never do is, God, I'll never be a millionaire. And God has yet to answer that. But all teasing aside, maybe, maybe the thing that you said you would never do or the thing that was done to you was not a joke. Maybe the thing that was said to you didn't leave anybody laughing. Oh, I'm never, never going to be like my father. He left us. He said he'd never leave us, but yet he still left. I'll never get caught up in that addiction. I'll never get caught up in that kind of relationship. And then the person that we never intended to become, we became. You, you ever make a promise to yourself? that you swore you'd never break, or maybe someone made it to you and then it finally broke. You said, I do, and all of a sudden they said, I don't anymore. And all of a sudden we're, f we're filled with feelings of inadequacy and insecurities where we're feeling like failure is absolutely final, like we can't measure up, like, like we're just not enough. If you could relate to me this weekend, there's a, a man in the scripture that could absolutely resonate with the state of our emotions. There's a man by the name of Peter. Peter was a friend and follower of Jesus. He followed Jesus, and Peter was a bold follower. He, he was an individual bold in his conviction, bold in his faith. He was a pillar of the church, and he actually helped mobilize individuals to start other churches to spread Christianity. And you may be thinking right now, whoa, 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 hold up, Jay. I have nothing in common with this guy. This guy seems to have it all put together, and I'm still trying to pick up the pieces of my life. But if you give me a few moments as I share with you his story, I believe that what you'll see is there's a lot of similarities. Because you see, Peter's story is, is our story. But you see, Peter didn't always start off as Peter. Matter of fact, his real name was Simon. And see, back in those days, names were significant. Names determined your destiny. It determined what you would do in the future. And so for Simon, his name meant to hear and to listen. Perhaps you can relate to that name Maybe the things that you've heard, the voices that you've been listening to has now dictated what you did. And now what you've done has become your identity. But you see, Simon's name got changed into Peter the moment he encountered Jesus. And for the, the name Peter, it actually means the rock. I mean, can you imagine how, how successful you would feel having your name changed to the rock? Hey, you're now better than Dwayne Johnson. You're better than the Scorpion King. A lot of things are better than the Scorpion King, but you're better than the Scorpion King. You are strong. You are stable. You're the rock. But one of Peter's first encounters with Jesus, he wasn't feeling too successful. Matter of fact, they met on a boat. Peter was a successful fisherman. He was a paid professional. But on the day that he met Jesus, Scripture states that he had worked all night and caught no fish. Maybe you, you can 
You can relate to his state. I, I, I worked so hard on these kids. I gave them everything. I made sure that they were always happy, and I tried to protect them from going this direction, but they still went this direction, and now I feel like I failed them. As a parent, I've caught no fish. I worked so hard on this business, and I gave all my time, all my effort, and yet we still got bankrupt, and I feel like I failed. As a business person, I gave all my, my love and my, my dedication to this person. They still walked away. I've, I've worked so hard all night, and I caught no fish, and Jesus was telling the disciples, why don't you go out a little bit deeper and cast your nets there, and then you'll find some fish. And, and Peter was saying, but we worked all night, but since you said so, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that. And they cast it deeper, and they caught so much fish that the nets began to break and that the boats began to sink. And you would automatically think that, hey, if that was me, I got a boat full of fish, I feel successful, but... Not Peter. He didn't respond that way. He said, get away from me, Lord. I'm such a mistake maker. Get away from me, Lord. I'm such a, a failure because you can have a life full of things and still feel like a failure. And Jesus not only stayed, he actually tells Peter, why don't you come follow me and I'll make you fishers of people. And so for three years, Peter starts following Jesus, and he grows up into the ranks, becoming one of the top leaders of the disciples, and he was a big mouth kind of guy. And you may know some people in your circle of influence that are like Peter, the open mouth, insert foot kind of people. That was Peter. So it got Jesus into a whole lot of good things, but it got Peter in a whole lot of bad things. And one, one instance in particular, Jesus is telling all his friends, hey, you guys are going to desert me. I'm going to have to die, and you're going to leave me. And so Peter pipes up and says, I'll never do that. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, actually, you're going to deny me three times, Peter, before the, the rooster crows. Never. These guys can leave, but I will never do that. Those words will never come out of my mouth. i die before I say that. And then Peter finds himself warming up next to a charcoal fire. And he crumbles under the pressure of the accusations. Hey, you look like that man that was with Jesus. Are you that man? And he says, no, I never knew him. You sound like that man that was with Jesus. Are you sure you're not that man? Are you sure you don't know him? No, I don't know who you, you're talking about. Hey, you look like the guy that was with Jesus when we arrested him. Are you sure you're not with him? He says, I've never seen him. And he swore so emphatically, like the sailor that he was, and then all of a sudden, the rooster crows, and that crow crumbled Peter. It was as though the rock had hit rock bottom, because the, the crow, it reminded him that, Peter, you failed again. Peter, you, your words failed people again. Peter, you made another mistake. Can I ask you, what does that crow sound like for you? What crow are you listening to? For, for Peter, it cowered him. It crippled him. After the crow, something converted. Something died. And Peter, it's almost as though he went back to being Simon. Because later on, he tells his boys, he says, hey, guys, I'm going to go back fishing. I want to go back to the boat and go back to the place that I failed before. And this is where Jesus finds him again. And we're going to pick up his story from one of his friends who had an account of this. John was also a follower of Jesus, and he wrote this encounter with Jesus and Peter in John chapter 21. This is what he says. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter had not only failed himself, he had failed Jesus. But yet Jesus responds in something so counterintuitive. Because, you see, it's natural for every single one of us to want to distance ourselves from people that would try to deny us. Question someone's love from someone who's tried to lie to us. But yet Jesus, he looks at Peter, and he looks at his failures, and he says two of the most profound words. And he says it to you and I this weekend. It's this, follow me. What, 
What do you do when failure is always in front of you? What do you do to overcome the sound of the crow that cripples us and cowers us in our life? If you have something to write with, I want to encourage you to take some notes. In your program, there's a place to take notes. Feel free to use your, your smartphone in all of our locations. Here's the principle that pops out of Peter's story that we need to apply in our lives, and it's this, that we must live restored. We have to live restored. And I'm almost certain that every single one of us would desire to live a life that moves us past our past, that frees us from the tight fist grip of our failures, that causes us to live restored with relationships that's wrecked us and that we've wrecked ourselves, to have us walk in triumph despite tragedies, to have a, a life full of purpose even though there used to be pain. Unfortunately, you and I, we can't have that on our own because the crow cowers us and it crumbles us and it converts us because every single one of us here could relate to the Simon inside Peter. And that crow reminds us that I fell short as a parent once again. I fell short as a husband once again. I fell short as a student once again. I failed at my job once again. I, I failed in my neighborhood once again. I failed in my community once again. And we end up holding on to our hangups and more than just holding on to our failure, it seems like failure has a hold on us and it's become who we are. But you see, the reason why we live this way is more than just the Simon inside us. It's deeper than that. It's a spiritual nature that every single one of us has been born with. And it's what biblical authors and what Jesus calls a sin. Sin is any action, any thought, any intention that goes contrary to who God is. And this sin has, has created in us a separation, a distance from us and God, just like Peter this sin causes us to be driven in denial, and this denial causes us to live defeated and destroyed. It, it destroys our relationships, it destroys us physically, and it destroys us spiritually, separating us from God and all things good. And the payment of sin is eternal judgment and ruin. But God saw the distance that our denial created, and he says, I love them. That's my child, and I want to restore right relationship back with them. And so he sends his one and only son, Jesus, to come down and bridge the gap that our sin and our denial has created. And so Jesus came with his sole mission to die, to defeat death. So our failures, our mistakes, our shame, our insecurities, our guilt heaped upon the, the life of Jesus. And in his death, he defeated death once and for all so that those that will believe in Jesus by faith would be forgiven, but not just forgiven. Jesus rose from the grave, defeating sin, death, and hell, so that through the power of his resurrection, we don't have to just be forgiven. We have new life. We're able to live restored through the power of his resurrection. How does this happen? God's spirit makes its home into our spirit, the spirit that is crumbled under the sound of sin, the one that denies God and distances ourselves from him moves out. And now the spirit that is made right with him moves in. Now we have a different sound that we're listening to. Follow me. And this spirit allows us to live a life of restoration with God and also with others. So how do we live restored? We're, we're going to be looking at John chapter 21. And I want to give us three complimentary thoughts this weekend. And the first is this. To live restored face your failures. John chapter 21, this is what it says. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. You ever notice that there's some things in our life that we settle for that other people will settle for too? Well, I've always been a part of broken relationships. That's all I've seen, so I guess I'll go fishing too. I've always seen this addiction. I've always seen this kind of behavior in my family and the, those around me. I guess I'll go fishing too. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the nets on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. And so they cast it and now they were not able to haul it because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he was stripped for work and he threw himself into the sea. 
Peter had failed first as a fisherman, worked all night, caught no fish. So he starts following Jesus. Denies Jesus, fails as a follower, says, you know what? I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to the place that I failed before and once again has caught no fish. Failure upon failure upon failure. Peter had found himself in the same boat, in the same predicament, in the same failure. And all of a sudden, he hears a voice in the shore that says, children, you caught any fish? And they didn't know who it was, so they said, no. Why don't you throw it on the other side of the boat, and you'll catch some there. Peter must have been thinking, where does this voice sound familiar? Where have I heard this before? Where have I heard those instructions before? Oh, yeah. It reminds me of when I found myself in this last failure, when I found myself in this boat again three years ago before I left it all behind. And so he doesn't question the voice. He just throws it on the other side. And they caught so much fish that they couldn't haul it all in. And that's when John, the author of the book, says to Simon, Simon Peter, it's the Lord. And that's all Simon needed to listen to. That's all Simon needed to hear because all of a sudden the old Peter is back. The spontaneous, erratic Peter is back. He's putting on his jammies and he's going overboard. And he starts to swim to shore. I've got to wonder what kind of waters were out that day. I wonder if the, the waters were, were, were crashing in his face that he couldn't even see the, the shoreline and he couldn't see clearly where he was going. I wonder if the currents were so strong that it tried to pull him back to the boat that he left behind. I wonder if it was so strong that it tried to, to pull him back to that failure that he was trying to swim away from. I wonder what kind of voices he was listening to. What if it's not the Lord, Peter? Stop swimming. What if you mess up again, Peter? Stop swimming. What if you let him down again, Peter? Why don't you stop swimming? All we know is that Peter kept on swimming. You see, failure is only final if we stay out at sea. But if we desire to live restored, we got to be willing to jump overboard. That means we have to be willing to say, I can't stay in this pain. I got to go overboard. I can't stay in this mistake. I got to jump overboard. Yeah, I know I might look foolish, but I can't stay in this place. I can't stay in this failure because if I stay in this failure, I'll never be set free. Failure was never meant for us to live in. It was always meant for us to learn from. I'm not saying that Peter looked like Michael Phelps out there in the water. I'm not saying he even did a swan dive off the boat. I'm not saying for you that it's not going to be hard and not going to feel uncomfortable saying, I'm sorry for hurting someone. All I'm saying is take a stroke closer to the shore. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's not going to pull you out of your comfort zone, asking for accountability, asking for counseling. All I'm saying is if, if you want to, to stop swimming, you're going to drown. But if you want to make it to the shore, you got to take a stroke, ask for the help. If you want to live restored, you have to be willing to go overboard. Perhaps the, the cure for the fear of failure is not swimming around in a circle of success. What, what if the cure for failure is just small doses of failure so that you and I could become immune to them so that we can continue to face them and live restored? So apply for the job again. Take a stroke. Forgive them again. Take a stroke closer to the shore. Write the book again. Start the business again. Say, I'm sorry. Again, take a stroke closer to the shore. Face your failure. Secondly is this, to live restored, redefine your failure. John chapter 21 says, when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. Now, all throughout Scripture, there are tons of references in regards to fire. It's all over the place in Scripture. But there's only two passages of Scripture where you can find a particular kind of fire, a charcoal fire. The first place is where you find it as Peter is warming himself up next to a charcoal fire right before he denies Jesus. And now the second time you see it is Jesus warming up breakfast for his brothers. 
One fire meant betrayal. Another fire meant breakfast. It was the same word. It's just that the word got redefined. The fire that Peter could make up was a fire of denial, but the fire that Jesus was able to create was one of renewal and restoration. And he invites his brothers over for breakfast. Now, you don't just invite any random people over for a meal, especially if you don't like them. You're not going to invite them first thing in the morning for them to ruin the rest of your day. He invites his brothers. He says, hey, boys, come, come over here for breakfast, and I've already got something prepared for you. I've got fish heating up. i got bread. This is better than filet of fish from McDonald's, y'all. Jesus is cooking something up. And as Jesus is warming up this fish, I wonder if Peter starts looking at that fire and starts reminiscing all the things that went wrong. You know, any time that you trigger all five of your senses, the, the memory tends to stick longer. He's looking at the fire, and he's hearing the crackling. Oh, I remember that crackling because that crackling reminded me of when I denied Jesus. Oh, I remember that charcoal smoke. Oh, that smell of that charcoal smoke. I remember it because that's the smoke that I remember sniffing right before I crumbled and failed him. And I remember the heat of that fire because that's the same heat that burned me with my my failure. And Jesus is saying to Peter, oh, I know, Peter, that when you look at that fire, it, it, it looks like your failure. But let me redefine that for you because wait until you taste my fish. I remember, for me, charcoal smoke is like one of my most favorite things to smell. Because it reminds me of hot dogs, hamburgers, cookouts, and s'mores. Look, it didn't used to always rem- remind me of those things because I'm not much of a griller. I burn things to a crisp. Like, crisp. Crisp. But it wasn't until I started getting getting around people that knew how to work the fire. It wasn't until I started getting around people that knew how to work the charcoal and I started tasting what they can put on top of it and it started changing the way that I would look at some things. You see where I'm going here? Sometimes the person that's in charge of the fire is also the one that's in charge of the definition. Maybe there's some things right now in your life, there's some fires that you've made and it means pain, it means loneliness, it means unforgiveness. But what if, what if Jesus is not trying to put it out? What if he's just trying to put something on top of it? Fish. If you want your failure redefined, you have to look to the one that doesn't change in definition. For us, if we're the ones that makes the fire It can go good or bad depending on how we respond that day, but God is the same. He's consistent in the charcoal. He's consistent and faithful in the failure, and he's consistent in the fire. And if he's faithful, he can still redefine it. And so sometimes what God has to do is take you back to that place. Oh, I know that that fire meant you're you're, you're broken. But let me, let me redefine it for you. Wait until I put some fish on top of it and let me show you that I can still build things from broken pieces. Let, let, let me take you back to that fire that, that meant your failure. But can I just show you right now? I'm about to redefine it for you. I'm about to take, put some fish on it. And I'm going to show you that I have future for your failures. If you want your failure redefined, you have to look to the one that doesn't change in definition. Lastly is this. To live restored, move forward. John chapter 21 says, When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. Peter had denied Jesus three times. Jesus is now questioning Peter three times. Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
It wasn't that Jesus was trying to beat Peter over the head because of his mistakes. It wasn't that he was trying to belittle Peter. I believe Jesus was trying to get Peter to move forward. Peter, you can either stay in this prison called failure or you can make it a platform for my restoration. You got to move forward, feed some sheep. You, you, you can either stay here in this, in this defeat or you can walk in your destiny, move forward, follow me, Peter. Interestingly enough, Every time that Jesus questioned Peter, he referred to him as Simon. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Wait a second. Didn't Jesus know that Simon was Peter's old name? Didn't Jesus know that that every time that he would call Peter Simon, it would be because he made a mistake. It would be because he failed. It would be because he wasn't operating under his potential. If you were Jesus, why would you even ask Simon that? Simon failed. You, you don't want to say anything to Simon. If you were Jesus, wouldn't you want to talk to Peter? Wouldn't you want to talk to the rock? Wouldn't you want to talk to someone who has your back? Someone who is strong and courageous under conflict? Wouldn't you want to talk to that guy? But it's almost as though Jesus is saying, hey, I'm, I'm going to need you to move aside, Peter. I've got something to say to Simon. Hey, I'm, I'm going to have to move that behavior that you tried to mask your, 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 your bad decision with. I'm going to move that aside because I've got something to say to Simon. Oh, that, that lifestyle that, that you tried to, to mask that, that mistake with, I, I'm going to have to ask that person to, to move aside. I've got something to say to Simon. And, and every time... Every time that Peter would respond, Lord, you know I love you, he said to him, an assignment. Why would he say that? It's because failure is not your identity. It's merely an event. And he's saying, I've got an assignment for Simon. And I believe that God sees the Simon inside every single one of us. And I believe he's speaking to the Simon inside every single one of us. And he's calling us to move forward. I've got destiny for you. i got a plan for you. I know that you've been stuck in this failure and you didn't feel like you could move forward. But can I just show you there's future for that failure too? Come and follow me and find out. Oh, I know that you felt like you were stuck in that pain, but there's purpose in that pain if you would just follow me. Come and find out. The purpose for our restoration is for the rest of those around us to experience restoration. What if your, your greatest misery is what God wants to use as your greatest ministry? What if God wants to bring, bring you back to that, to that place where you see a person similar to where you've been before? Oh, I've been in that pain before, and let me show you my scars. I'm here to show you, not to show you that these cars never hurt me, but to show you that God still heals. Come and follow me. I know that you've you felt that that relationship has broken you down and, it, and, and you can't get back up. I've been there before, but let me show you that God can still build out of broken pieces. Let me, let me show you, come, come follow me, even though you feel like you've been wrecked. Let me, let me show you that there's a God that can still restore follow me and find out maybe you're here today and you felt you feel like you can't move forward you feel like failures in front of you and there's no other way out can I just tell you that there is a voice that's saying come follow me follow me the only way that you and I could ever live a life of restoration is by first placing our faith in Jesus to have that relationship restored so today, if you're here and if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and you make him the Lord of your life and, and, and to place your, your whole life in his hands, would you make that your response today? Would you say, yeah, I want to I deny the life that denies God and I want to begin to follow him and I want to receive his free gift of forgiveness through faith and I want his spirit to allow me to move in a life of restoration. Maybe you've already made that decision right now. You've already decided to follow Jesus. Who do you need to share your restoration with? What failure do you need God to redefine in your life? I believe that God wants to speak to every single one of us. So right now, would you just open your heart? Would you close your eyes? Would you pause and would you pray? Would you allow the Spirit of God to speak to you? Let's pray. 
Thank you so much for joining us on our online campus. We hope that you were encouraged by today's message. We hope that so much more than just hearing one of our pastors speak, we hope that it was the voice of God that you heard speaking through their message. And so if today for the very first time you responded to the voice of God by saying yes to following Jesus, we just wanna say congratulations. We wanna say welcome home and we would love the chance to celebrate that decision with you. So actually right now you can interact with one of our online campus hosts. You can do so in the comment section or by clicking on the prayer tab. Additionally, if you'd like to partner with us financially so that we can continue to share the message of Jesus with more and more people, you can do so by clicking on the Give tab or by visiting lifehousechurch.org and clicking Give. Our prayer for you is that this is a great week ahead of you as you continue to walk with the Lord and walk in community, and we hope to see you back here next weekend.